Gentlemen, it took me five years to start my first fund. 1999, I said I'm going to start a fund. When I learned that you could make 20% <laughs> on someone else's money, I was like, I'm in. 2004, I started my first fund. Five years, no one ever taught me how to do a fund. I didn't have any mentors. I had to learn it all myself. And I hope, I know I have, condensed down time, the learning curve for people to learn funds. And Bridger and my son, John, and the whole team, you guys, and Mason, uh, you guys have done great. And I just can't tell you how happy I am that people around the world and in this country uh, now know about funds and how to put one together, as opposed to it used to be a mystery, mystery and all this stuff. So I am, I am so happy that, that, it's, that, it's, that it's really worked. Now, so... As you guys know, I've written a couple books. I, have, I brought these. If you don't have one, take one. If you have one, we'll take another one. They're all signed. And I brought a few of these. I didn't have as many. I got to order some more. I wrote this a little while ago. If you want one of these, I only have two, but I can get you some more. Anyway, I think you might like. Give them the pieces on that one. <laughs> well, there, you don't want to uh, yeah, I have. Look, I, I have. I have videos. I have videos at Mr. You go to MrMormon.com or BigBangBible.com. And anyway, I have 11, 12 videos. The first three videos are done really, really well. I paid a guy to do incredible motion graphics. The first video is about six minutes. It goes over chapter one of this book, and it gets you pumped for it. And it's got incredible, I'm telling you, incredible motion graphics. I've had people call me and ask me how much I spent on it because it's that, it's that good. Anyway, um, that, that, that one has, has now has 2.2 million views on, on YouTube. YouTube, Facebook, uh, all the other places. So, yeah, it's been out. But anyway, you will really, I think you'll really like the, at least the first three. Just watch the motion graphics. But they basically, they basically um, summarize in three or four minutes the first three chapters. So there's three, there's three videos, one, two, three. And if, you'll just, if you watch those and you like those videos, then you might like the book. Okay. Okay, now, I don't know what I'm going to, I have a bunch of stuff I want to do, but let me do, give you an update on Bitcoin. Bitcoin became an ETF, 11 companies did an ETF, and now they can sell Bitcoin. So, a couple interesting things that are strange to me, but not strange that way, but, so you'll notice that Bitcoin, a few months back was 27,000. And then it, you know, did this and did this and thir about 31,000 and came back and did this and this and came back and then up, up, up and 46,000, you have ETFs selling it and then it dropped, all right? Well, think about it this way. If my theory is true, the 11 companies that became ETF sellers, okay, here or here, somewhere in here, are told by the head of the SEC, we're going to approve all 11 of you guys. So what you should do is you guys should start buying Bitcoin so that when the, you, you open your ETF, you can sell the Bitcoin to all the people buying in at record numbers. You can sell the Bitcoin at 46,000 to them, the Bitcoin you bought at 31 or 27,000. That's my theory. And there, that's why it went down. And that's why you had record sales is because Black Rocks of the world and these other, the 11 people, 11 companies, ETFs, they bought the Bitcoin to sell to you. Me and you would have done it that way. We would have thought, wait a minute, Bitcoin's going to be an ETF. The day goes ETF when I put a, $100 order in to buy Bitcoin, it'll go into the ETF. The ETF will have to go out to the market and buy Bitcoin to put it in the ETF, and that will make the price go up. That's how me and you would think about it. But it's all a game. If my theory is true, it's all a game. And now these 11 companies are in cahoots with the SEC to protect and promote the U.S. dollar, and Bitcoin being one of those threats to the U.S. dollar. So it's, what I'm saying is it's now arrived into a bigger game. It went from college baseball to major league baseball. Whatever the analogy you want to use, it's in the bigger game and it's in a bigger arena. So let me tell you two things that happened with the Black Rock application. Back in, I don't know, September, 
Genzer, who's the head of the SEC, said, we're delaying the ETFs for Bitcoin because we need the applicants, BlackRock, to make some adjustments, modifications to their, applica to their application to be an ETF. <laughs> what, modif what modifications are you wanting the, the, the applicants to do? Two things that are strange. After reading, I didn't read the whole thing, but two things I picked out of the BlackRock application, okay? And this is, I believe this is true for the other 11, or the other 10, but I didn't read them. But think about what I'm about to say here. The one is, let me make sure, uh, and I've got to paraphrase it here. Um, the one says, there's one page in the, in the application, BlackRock, it says, and I'm paraphrasing here, the sponsor, who is BlackRock, the sponsor, if at any time in the future the product, meaning Bitcoin, ever forks, the sponsor may choose the fork which is um, not advantageous to the sponsor's customer financially. Why would you write that into an application for ETF? What is the plan? I mean, they're disclosing that in the future, if the Bitcoin ever forked and one fork was less valuable, they could choose that fork and not choose the other fork. And even if this fork goes down in value to it, they're, to the people who bought the BlackRock ETF, even if it's less, less, uh, uh, less financially advantageous, the sponsor may choose to take that fork. Why is that even in the application? That's number one. Number two, in the application, it also says, and I'm paraphrasing, that the sponsor has the ability to write more contracts, paper, than it owns its actual product. That's what the ETF can do for the purpose of smoothing out markets. What it just said is that the ETF can write paper, like we discussed earlier, that the gold spot there's more gold paper in the world than actual gold. There's more options on gold by far, 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 far than there actually is gold. And that's how they keep gold. And that's how JP Morgan over all those years spoofed and used the futures market to write paper on the silver market, precious market, and they kept it. They corralled it for nine years. And that's why they got fined a billion dollars. JP Morgan got fined a billion dollars for manipulating the precious metals market for nine years. Why, how? Using futures market and using paper, writing paper. Well. The BlackRock application says they can write paper on their own ETF. I thought it was, spot, I thought it was a spot price. I thought it was a spot price ETF. It is mostly, but the company can write papers. Those are two strange things that, well, why would you write that into the modify your application? And then they let, let all 11 at the same time go forward. And I, I assume that these characteristics in BlackRock's um, application is, should be the same or similar in the other applications. Okay? Questions? That's all I really know about the, the update. That's my update. Any questions there? Or any comments? Does the, does the issuance of paper allow them to be market makers for their own ETF? They can sell more Bitcoin than they actually own. That's what I thought, yeah. <laughs> they don't own, they own 100 Bitcoin. They can sell 105 Bitcoin. Yeah. Right? And not go to the market. Yeah. I have to point. So I believe on that, the other exchanges can do a similar thing. Yeah. So FTX, Coinbase, Binance could also accept orders, make the transaction while they gives them time to go hopefully acquire that Bitcoin. Right. A lot of, I was talking to Whale last week, he owns 5,000 Bitcoins. Wow. Um, his yearly audit he does on so he owns, he's had he's one of the beginning early crypto guys. <coughs> his five thousand bitcoins. He sells all uh, or he uh, yeah, he sells all of them on the January first every year. Every year, I think January first. For tax reasons or what? Or he'll sorry not sell. Well, he'll sell no. What he sell? Anyways, he'll move them off the exchange. Yeah. That's what he does. Sorry, he moves all the bitcoins off the exchange to a different exchange. Mm. 
or to a, a cold storage wallet, yep. wherever he's at, yep. just to prove that they have Bitcoins. Oh, okay, yeah. And yeah. his thing was, he's like, if we, we should all do this as an audit on the internet. Yeah, yeah. Every year we should pick a day, and all of us should call our Bitcoins due. Right. <laughs> and we'll see who's under, who's got underwear on. Yeah, right, you know? right, right. And then we'll put them all back. If we'll yeah. put them back where we were. That was yeah. his audit. He didn't sell, but he pulled back. Yeah. All right. It, it, yeah, it's back up. It's back up. It's back up. So they're it's getting out of control of getting that. First point, I don't think it's strange to put that into the really the forking. Does it, yeah, the forking to have that, too. that they would choose the the other fork that's not well, as financially to their clients. From a legal perspective, I mean they're covering their bases, right? In the yeah. event that they have to, it might be the detriment. You have a fork, and there's been forks in the past where you have. Um, you know, there's Bitcoin Classic and there's Bitcoin. Yeah. It possibly, they could have to go that way, but it okay. would probably be their advantage. Okay. You know, for protect, protect themselves, right? Yeah, there's right. a pre fork, and a, I'm not a Bitcoin expert, but maybe there at some point is a pre fork and post fork Bitcoin. Like, there's all these different varieties of Bitcoin. Right, there's coins that were minted before the ETF yep. and the ones that were minted after. Yep. That's what they're... Well, so, so again, my theory about this whole thing you heard, I, I might be, I give myself 15% chance of being wrong. So I could be wrong. I'm not saying I'm right. Next, next thing, update on, I don't know if I can explain this to this group, but the, and I did par partially, the um, China brokers a deal, a, a, a peace deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Why? From the China point of view, China is trying to de-dollarize the world. So they know that, and they want to buy oil from Saudi Arabia in the yuan, but they can't because Saudis won't sell it to them in the yuan. Why? Because the Saudis need the United States' military to protect them against places like Iran. So China goes to Iran and says, listen, Iran, who do you hate more, Saudi Arabia or China? No, sorry, Saudi Arabia or the United States? Well, we obviously hate the United States more. Then stop attacking because you got to choose here. Because we are going to, in the future, try to buy oil from Saudi Arabia in the Yuan. That's going to decrease the United States' power by not allowing, by allowing oil transactions to go in the Yuan, not in the U.S. dollar. And Iran goes, wow, that's great. Let's, let's hurt the United States. And so... Well, you got to sign the peace treaty because it's going to take a few years for the Saudis to believe that you no longer are going to attack them. And then maybe in the future, the Saudis can say to the United States, we don't need your aircraft carriers. We don't need your military. We don't need your F-35s anymore. That's why we're going to start selling to our biggest customer, China, in the Yuan. And, Saudi, and, and Iran goes, you know, you're right. Let's do it. And they sign. And then just a few months later, a little, a little while later, President Biden realized He's losing, we are losing in the Middle East because of this peace treaty. And then Biden sends over $4 billion cash to the Iran Iranians to say, look, we're still good guys. We want to be your friends. We're not, you know. Why did he send the $4 billion? Because he was losing. Why did China do it? Because they're trying to de-dollarize the world and trying to make the dollar less, you know, prolific in the world. How do you do that? You got to, Saudi Arabia is the kingpin. Questions? Comments? That's just an update on my theory of the... Because Hamas was, they're not thundering, Hamas, the Houthi rebels were Iran-backed. Yeah, and the, 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 they, I, the, they stopped it's, attacking? Well, the ironic thing is we're now raising money in Congress to fund, fund Ukraine and fund Israel. So in reality, if we sent the $4 billion to Iran and Iran sent the money to Hamas, and we're now sending money to Israel, we are funding both sides of the war which is the ironic part of the whole situation. But again, who's funding it? The US dollar is funding both sides of that war. The magic, magical product, the best product ever produced by mankind on the face of the planet, the US dollar, is funding both sides of that war. That's our magic product. And that's what Biden did. He sent all $4 billion in what? His best product ever, the US dollar. OK, anything else on that? Anyone make a comment? All right, so I thought, what's that? How has, I, I haven't checked, how's the US dollar done in the, in the last year compared to Saudi, Iran, China? Have you looked on that? Well, China's look like this. The dollar's held up pretty good. And they keep printing more and it's held up pretty, I mean, better than most people expected. Yeah. It, it came up, 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 up. 
and then it's come down, but it's come back up a little bit. Look, if you go after all the predictions, the US dollar should have been with all the printing and all the whatever, and it just doesn't. Your economics 101 class in college, supply and demand. If you print a bunch of these things, like trillions of them, the price of it should go down. It's going down, but not as fast as everybody else, especially not as fast as you want, because they are in hurt, they are in big hurt over there. China is in, China is in a 1929, 1930 depression. They are in serious economic trouble. Right now? Yeah, right now. Right now. Like some reports came out this past week about it, right? Oh, it's been going on for, you know. I haven't seen the news for a week, yeah. yeah. Oh, like the, the whole stock market and. Oh, no, the Yangtzeing, yeah, hitting all time lows and. and it's yeah. Being propped up by the government. Oh, yeah, they're buying, they're buying their shares now, yeah. Whatever. It's, it's, I mean, I know there's a big mess. bubble, but. No, it's you know, bad. It to the extent of. Why should you talk on that? Okay, no. I've got two, uh, two videos I watched in the last three or four months uh, on TikTok, kind of you know, a little bit of this lady. She has 105 employees. She has no orders. There's no one in her shop. She lives in China. She lives in China. And she's posting, look, I called every single customer that I've had for the past five years. I called them all. I don't have one order. None, zero, not a half an order. I have no orders. I have all my employees are gone home. They're not there. Not truck, truck driver. He's in Hang Sing. I can't remember where he's at. He's, he's in a port city. I can't remember the port city. He says, I'm a truck driver. You see all these containers? They're stacked four high. See them? They're a mile long. They're all empty. There's no orders. There are 16,000 truck drivers in this city. 3,000 are working. That's how bad it is. Right? The unemployment, youth unemployment in China is so bad, they stopped reporting it. Youth unemployment meaning from 18 Teen to, 30. to 30. Yeah. If you are a college graduate, if you're a college graduate in one of the big cities and you have a job, now get this, you're a college graduate in China and you're in a big city and you have a job, which is odd, if you have a job, the average monthly salary is $650 to $950. That's a college graduate average in a big city. $650 to $950, that's the average salary right now. They're hurting bad. I'm telling you, it's bad. It's going to be years, not months. It's going to be years to pull, pull out of that. Okay, questions, Any comments? What do you think about, um, so I was thinking about, when I read the book, I was thinking about how you were analyzing, hey, we're printing more money, but you know, the value of the dollar is still very resistant. Compared to other, other for currencies, yeah. So my perspective of that is maybe the actual inherent core is the American economy vis-a-vis -vis consumerism is the actual product, mm -hmm. and the dollar is the marketing product. So the more we print, the more it's <clears throat> promoted uh, in the dollar itself is backed by the American economy. Thought, yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. The, 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 the engine is right. the consumer, American consumer. Right. They consume everything from all over the world. They want, they want things from every country in the world. Come here and I'll pay you these things with the U.S. dollar, right? But the difference is, I think the big difference is the U.S. dollar, if you take all the loans in the world, they're mostly do dollar denominated. So people have to pay them back in U.S. dollars. The, the, the secret is they got the U.S. dollar accepted all over the world, then they lent it to everybody. And now all these people are locked into U.S. dollar-based loans all over the world. And that's, the, that's one of the biggest tools that the, the, the government has used uh, to proliferate and make sure that you can't get away from the U.S. dollar because everything's in loans. Where do you see the national debt fitting into this system? No. It's getting to a point, obviously, where the interest is going to be the second biggest expense per year, uh, and past uh, you know Social Security. I mean, it'll be it'll be Social Security, the, the interest on national debt, military, you know, which is that's not good, and so it's it's coming to an epic point, um, and that is, I believe, when there will be the, you know, the reinvention of the U.S. dollar. And that's when it will, somehow there will be a crisis. It will be um, a cyber attack. 
that you come, wake up one morning in your bank, you go to the morning bank, and all, half of your money is gone. And my, half of my money is gone. Just, just think this through. And, this half, and, and the government says there was a huge cyber attack, and they, people came in to grab all your money, and we stopped them before they can get the other half of your money. And you're so glad that the government stopped them from getting the other half of the money. And to protect everyone from this future happening, we're all going to ship to the digital dollar at one big, because you have to have a crisis. You have to have the country that needs to do it all at one time. That's one way. And my other way in my book, I do a soft way over many, many years. You know, they have the crisis and they, um, that, that we're going broke and we need to, you know, change to the U.S. dollar so people, we, tax dodgers can't, you know, sc scoot around the edges. That's another way. So those are, those are a few ways. I don't know how they're going to do it, but they're definitely going after it. And, 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 and maybe, maybe they're trying to commit the crisis. Maybe they're just spending and spending and spending and spending and spending, trying to make it to a crisis where we have to do something crazy like switch to the U.S. dollar. I don't know if you know this, a few years back, Cyprus, little country, Cyprus, they woke up on one morning, I think it was a Monday morning, and that w that's what happened. About half of the money was out of everyone's bank. And they said the country was going to go broke, therefore we all had to tax anyone that had over, I don't know, $100,000, I'm not sure what the number was. The rich people, we took half their money, and that kept the country alive. If we didn't do it, the country would have gone down and you would have lost all your money. So aren't you glad the, 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 the government grabbed half your money and saved the other half of your investment? So patriotic. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the digital age. When things are digital, when things are digital, this is what can happen. Is that the degree? physical dollars is a part of the marketing mystique. Say that again? The physical printed dollar is a part of the, like how else do you show the American status without the physical character. Yeah. So we'll see. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Aircraft, an aircraft carrier in your bag shows uh, yeah. some status too. You know what I mean? That, that, that's some serious, um, you know, we want you, you think about the, com the, co the companies that have left China. They've all fled China. Um, a lot of companies have in the last three or four years. And they've all went to countries like South Korea, Thailand, India, countries that buy their oil in U.S. dollars. So. Here's, a, here's a note going wow. back to China. I read this, Sorry. This, I think this was five, a week ago. Yeah, Cyprus. The, how bad it is in China. So Evergrande and you know, the other real estate developers. Yeah, yeah. This article said that oh, all major real estate developers have defaulted on their loans. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. The two biggest ones account for $500 billion of default. And Peter, put that in perspective. Yes, go. The great financial recession that we had yep. was $700 billion. Yep. And two is at $500 billion. Two companies. Hey, when did this happen? It's now. This is it's right now. Right now. Peter Zion, the other night I watched Peter Zion. Yeah, we got living under a rock. Lincoln, You've been rock, too bro. many textbooks are written last Lincoln, year. Too many textbooks. <laughs> They're written in 2023, man. Yeah. What is going on? What, what year's this shit? <laughs> <laughs> that whole case study is so old, old school, man. So, so last week I watched two weeks ago. Peter Zion said I watched him say that I think I think what he said was. The number of empty apartments that they've built in China is almost a billion units that can't, are never going to be used because the population is doing this. Mm. They overbuilt because of the way their tax system works. They kept building and building and building to create more taxes for their and for, and the revenues for the right, right? And, and, and it's collapsed. It's totally collapsed. Well, it's crazy. They have a lot of empty buildings outside of China as well. Right. This, what I'm saying, this problem in China is not going to be solved in a year or two or maybe even three or four or five. It is bad. It's really bad. And that, a big country like that, 1.3 billion, that ripples through a lot of parts, parts of the world. Yeah, so. I'm not getting any new EB5 investors. EB5. <laughs> or they, they, they might be fleeing. They might, yeah. they might be fleeing. Yeah. If they can flee, they'll... They, 
It's well, it's already it's already gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. September of 2022 would have been the time to start. Yeah, yeah. So who who are we training with? Like leaving China, who's our main? Mexico. Right All Mexico, right? It's going to Mexico. Yeah. And that got exact, that got exacerbated by COVID, right? Just with the yeah, that's right. That's right. Just having more proximity. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, exacerbated. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Sorry, do you have any other topics? I do. Oh, yeah. Keep going. But what, what? Go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to ask you about other topics. So other you... topics? Uh, yeah. What other topics you want to know about? Well, I was going to ask you. I was just reading uh, the other day. Barclays uh, spoofed LIBOR from 2000. It was a case study in this book from 2005 to 2011. They spoofed LIBOR, and they were fined a ton of money. Barclays Bank. I didn't know this. And I didn't know it either. I just read this book. So Barclays was so LIBOR is the London International Bank rate. Right. They would get. Traders apparently trade on that rate. That's right. They would have options traders that would send in, hey, can you put it up or down for us? Yeah. Apparently, six banks put tr put trades that they take out the highest and lowest. Yep. And they would put in above or below to move the rate up or down so their option traders would make money. Mm. And then later, when the 2008 crash happened, they would put in their rates higher. Oh, we're lending at a good rate, even though they weren't, to show that they were a stable uh, bank. Mm hmm. And they got fined all this money and almost got kicked out of the whole thing. It was a bar wow. bank. So they control LIBOR. Wow. I didn't think that was possible. And I think that's why they, maybe they went off LIBOR. And went to Sulphur. Yeah. They, lost, they lost all their credibility after that because yeah. they had spooked it. I did not know that. Wow. And I knew, I knew you'd love that. I do love that. So I do love that. You always are talking about there's a game within a game within a game. That's right. There are people currently manipulating the markets. Yes. So which, my question is, which markets do you think currently, in 10 years, we're going to find out, oh, this group was manipulating this market? You already said kind of Bitcoin, you think, any other markets? In Gold, the silver, Bitcoin, for sure. Uh, I, I, and I, I, I told you guys at your conference that I was uh, on your podcast in November, 1st November, I told you I was long gold, silver, and uranium. Because I think, I thought uranium, it's a bottleneck, it was going to go up, and it did go up big time. But I thought uranium had not been, the big boys had not focused on it to manipulate it. Mm -hmm. and it. And it seems like if I can find markets that there is a willing buyer and a willing seller that has an economic to come together and decide what the price is without manipulation, I have a higher probability of understanding when to buy and when to sell. But when there's manipulated markets, I seem like I try to find out what the manipulation is, and I, that's the only way I can play it. I have to understand what the manipulators are trying to do, and then go with that. So, but um, you know, I, don't, I, I, I really don't know at this point because if sulfur can be, if, if LIBOR can be manipulated, that is wild. That's wild. Yes, sir. Uh, with China being in the state that it is, uh, what do you think the Future of the Belt and Road Initiative is. It's bad. No, it's it's down. It's done. There's there's countries that are defaulting in, in Africa, and the Belt and Road. They're just saying no, we're not no, we're not doing it. We're not taking the yuan. We don't want the yuan. It's just it's just and that's what that's what Saudi Arabia is doing. That's what we're trying. We're kind of sending a message to Saudi uh, to Saudi Arabia. Aren't you guys so glad a few years back you didn't take the yuan? Because we put the pincers on China. But we, we look. China did it to themselves. Yeah. We just poured gas in the fire yeah. and helped it go down. Every if if, if you know uh, uh, Powell takes the Fed funds rate like this as fast as possible to five five and a quarter five and a half. China bought all their bonds back when it was low, all their U.S. Treasuries, yeah. and now every time China sells U.S. Treasuries, it kills them. They're losing so much money. The le the longer he can keep that up there. They have, to, they have to sell because they told them years ago, we're going to start, we hate the U.S. dollar, we're going to start selling our U.S. treasuries. Okay, well, we're, we're going to raise rates then. And my theory, if I'm right, is that part of the raised rates to five and five and a half percent was based on the, because the Fed knew they needed to raise rates to hurt China and other countries when they start selling U.S. treasuries. How do you get rates to five and a half? Well, if I said, if I'm the head of the Fed and I say, you know what, we just we're just going to go for inflation at two percent. I could have never convinced anyone that five and a half percent rates were good. Couldn't have never done them. But if I can get inflation to nine percent, the American people will accept five and a half percent interest rates. Yeah. So I've got to get to five and a half percent interest rates. I thought it was going to go to six and a half, but it may it may never get there. 
But if I, if, so if I'm running the Fed, I want to get to five and a half, I have to create 9% inflation. So I tell everyone, we're just trying to get 2%. That's all we're trying to do. And then inflation goes up. And you know what I said? It's at 4%. It's transitory. And when I know it's not. Then it goes to 5%. Then I say, this inflation is transitory. Everyone calm down. It's going to come right back down. It's just transitory. Then it goes to 6%. I'm doing it on purpose because I want to let it run to 9 If it runs to 8 and 9 then I can go. We're going to go from 2% to 4% to 5 to 5.5 really fast and kill everyone, right? And they, they're running a balancing act. So think about this. You think they're that smart? They are. I believe they're that smart because it's the biggest product in the world. It's the most, it's the most proliferated product in the world. And by definition, if you have the best product in the world, you have to have insatiable demand. It's not luck. It's not luck that the U.S. dollar is the best product in the world. Therefore, that's their best product. But back to my point. So they run it all up. They run it up there to 5.5% and keep it there to put the squeeze on China. And I lost my train of thought. Um, I had one more point. Come on. I had one more point about, uh, about the inflation rate to run it all up to the Federal Reserve. Um, balancing act. It was a balancing act. Thank you. Balancing act. Thank you. So, so they're in a quandary here. They have Congress that spends way too much money. It's like, it's, like a, it's like a married couple. One person spends all the money and the other person has to pay for it. Congress is out of control, maybe on purpose, I'm not sure. And the Fed, over all these years, has figured out every year how to, how to pay for it. It's unbelievable. But they can't go too high because they, they can't, they're, they're hurting the real estate market. You know, real estate agents don't, aren't making enough money this year. Title company agents, title companies are almost out of business. There's no transactions in the whole real estate business. So they can't, they, they, they want to hurt China and all these people, you know, keep the U.S. dollar, but they can't hurt the U.S. consumer too much. They have to balance it. They can hurt them a little bit, enough to hurt China, right? So if they, if they really want to do it, they would raise it up to 15% and really crush China, but they can't do it because it would hurt the consumer too bad. So they have to balance it. They're that smart. They're that smart to ba trying to balance it. So people have told, you know, oh, Blake, Mr. Powell, you're not going to have a soft landing. Well, so far, do you guys see a big, re you see a small recession? Big re you see a recession? He did it so far. Now, he might not be true the later on this year, but so far he has created a soft landing to a, an economy that was going to have a crash landing. And it might still crash, maybe on purpose in the future for a crisis. I mean, it might not. I'm not sure. But when I see Mr. Powell and the, the Federal Reserve, they do make mistakes. Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe they made mistakes. Like Putin said, and he agreed with me in my book, we made a mistake when we cut off Russia on the SWIFT system. And they just said, fine, we won't do the SWIFT system anymore. We'll just go to rubles and yuan and gold and oil. And that was a mistake because it decreased the, the probability the U.S. dollar will be you know, prolific for a longer period of time. So, so they have a balancing act. And I, I say to you, if I put you 20 years ago in, in, head of the Federal Reserve, and I said to you, you're head of the Federal Reserve, protect and promote the U.S. dollar. And by the way, Congress is going to spend like $16 trillion over these 20 years, or 10, whatever it was, $12 trillion. And, the, <laughs> and everything else is going to go to... You would have to figure out how to balance it and keep the economy going. And you'd have to be pretty smart and pretty uh, strategic to do what they've done. With the assumption that you can't control Congress. They won't stop spending money. You try and try and try. They just don't. Are my job is to keep the, my job is to keep the uh, dollar protected from the U.S. dollar. And and you have another party of your government that just spends, spends, prints, prints, spends, spends, spends. He's done a pretty good job. If you compare the challenge that he had, and he still he still has. So anyway. Predict rates dropping. This year, yeah, because it's an electric election year. Not, not a lot, but I think rates will drop sometime this year, summer, uh, because it's election year, right? And traditionally, every election year is an up year for the stock market. What do you make of, with that whole scenario, the regional banking crisis last year, the lending is going to end in March, and more, maybe more regional bank problems. Do you think that's part of a plan to consolidate banks to J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo? Yes, Margo? yes. Or do you think it's... Yeah. You, you got, 
yeah, the 11 banks here, you know, Citigroup and, uh, and J.P. Morgan, they're in cahoots. And as long as they're in, in the team, they're going to get sweetheart deals. And J.P. Morgan's going get, to get to buy banks at cheap, other banks. Or you know what I'm saying? So when the... They bought First Republic, what, six, six cents on the dollar? Yeah, right? First Republic Bank, six cents on the dollar. Why? No one else could bid. No one else could bid. Why? Because J.P. Morgan is in cahoots with the, the feds. They're, they're, te they're team members. They're a team. <coughs> you do something for me, I'll do something for you, you right? Clarify something. Yes. Yeah. So when you're saying the feds, right, like who specifically are you talking about? Are you talking about Powell and his 11, like, or is there, is there, is there somebody else behind the scene that you're talking about? Like who, who in particular? Is orchestrating this master plan. And honestly, I just don't think that they're they have that intellect. Honestly, like I think they're all they're all minded. Yeah. So this is the team, the Fed. Obviously, they they produce the dollar. These people are part of the team, and they help the Fed protect and promote the U.S. dollar. That's what they do. They don't all do it perfectly all the time. They're not all well a well oiled machine team. You got the CIA. Oh, yeah, you got the CIA. Toot to CIA. You got the CIA. And, and the globally significant banks, the GSIBs. There you go. There you go. And, and now, now, now you have JP Morgan, right? Citi, Citigroup, right? Just keep going down the list, right? Some examples US President Gold Confiscation 1933. Why? To, to promote the US dollar. They confiscated all the gold in the United States from your grandfather, my grandfather. Made it illegal to own gold. Okay? The SEC, just, just look at the Bitcoin thing and the, and, the, and the Ripple the Ripple lawsuit. Why did they extend Ripple? Ripple was, was meant to compete with the SWIFT system. The SWIFT system is a U.S. dollar-based system. Ripple, XRP, doesn't need U.S. dollars. It just goes around the banking system. You don't have to change your dollar, money into dollars to transfer stuff. You can just do Ripple, 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 right? So the SEC in November 2021 extends the, why would they extend the lawsuit against Ripple for two more years and then lose and then appeal again? What's so bit bad about Ripple? It competes against US dollar. The SEC is promoting and protecting the US dollar through this. The SEC sues JP Morgan learns how to manipulate the, the, the precious metal market for nine years. They teach the feds how it's done, and the feds go after Bitcoin because it's a competitor to the U.S. dollar. I don't believe the feds knew how to control the whole market until they learned it from J.P. Morgan, nine years of manipulation. J.P. Morgan got fined a billion dollars from the SEC. No one went to jail, though. This is the key. The SEC sues J.P. Morgan. Here's, here's a billion dollar fine, but no one goes to jail. Why? Because you're going to help us figure out how to control Bitcoin. That's how they learned it. It's all a big conspiracy. It's a great story, and it sells lots of books. So keep quiet. <laughs> yeah. If, uh, if the JP Morgan desk wasn't shorting silver, we'd have out of control silver prices. If, you know, they had it's a free market. Yeah. Ca capitalism. My whole entire financial life, I've been watching analysts call for $50 silver yep. and nearly $10,000 gold. Mm -hmm. Never happened. It's never going to happen. And it's not because they mine 2% of it a year. It's because they need to short it into oblivion to keep the dollar strong. There you go. Because it's... Now, look, guys. Aren't you so glad? Isn't everyone in this room so glad that we are on the same side of the Fed? Yes. Yeah. Don't we love the US dollar? Do you want tomorrow morning to wake up and find out the US dollar is worth one penny compared to today worth a dollar? Do you want that to happen tomorrow morning? Yeah. I'd be broke. You'd all be broke. We are on the best team ever. Look at this. This is our team. Stop fighting it. Stop fighting the team. This is a great team. This team's going to win for years and years and years and years. You don't bet against Michael Jordan. You just don't do it. And, St and Scottie Pippen, when they're on the same team, you just don't do it. You're an idiot if you do it. Now, back to your thing. Are they smart enough? Wait, I got one more before you make a comment. 
Did I ever tell you the idiot waiter story? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Okay. <laughs> I think so. There's this idiot waiter. We're at this restaurant. It's, it's a very high-end uh, restaurant. And there's this waiter, and they call him the idiot waiter because he's really bad at math. He is, everyone knows. All, you're all, we're all the other waiters, and we all know. He's bad at math. He's terrible at math. Why? Because every time he takes the money back to the cash register, and he brings it back to the customer, his, the change is always bad. The change is never right. It's never right. And he goes, oh, I'm very sorry. I'm really bad at math. That's why I'm a waiter. That's why I'm a waiter, because I'm not good at math. My accounting career went like this because I'm not good at math. But then the owner of the restaurant did an audit on the last 100 customers this dude had. And he found out that every time he brings the change back, 100% of the time, the change is in favor of the waiter. Not in favor. Wait, wait. If he's bad at math, it should be 50% in favor of the customer and 50% in favor of the waiter. But it's not. It's 100%. So who's really the idiot? The people who believe he's an idiot waiter? So the Fed will say, we didn't know it wasn't transitory. We thought it was transitory. That's why we had to catch up. They wanted it to go to 9%, but they couldn't tell you that. They kept telling you they're bad at math. And then they, make, they, they do the reports and they readjust them. They do the reports and they say, we're sorry, we made a mistake. And they do this all the time. They've done it for years. They make a prediction. Then later they say, we made a mistake. We, we're correcting it now. Blah, blah, blah. We made a mistake. We're correcting it now. And, they, and, they, and they, they, they apologize for it. Like, I'm the idiot waiter. I'm very sorry I'm bad at math. Everyone knows I'm bad at math. I'm very sorry. We're all idiots here at the Federal Reserve. But we wanted it 9%. Inflation, so we could raise to five and a half percent. Because if we had done two percent, we could have never raised to five and a half percent. And I say to you, we're the idiots if we believe what they tell us over the microphone. If you watch what they do, they're brilliant. We're the idiots if we keep interest rates low for too long, just so the American people think that we are that their economy is good. That's right. That's right. I used to go to the gas station and buy penny candy, and there were these old men that would drink coffee, and they wait. That, like, that was I was like their not their gimmick, because they pull a fifty cent piece or a quarter out of their pocket and a dollar, and I was old enough to know the difference. And they would say, "Which do you want?" And I would say, "I like the shiny one." Every time I would go to that gas station, all summer long, three summers in a row, I made probably like. 90 bucks and quarters and 50 cent pieces like you last Because they, they were having a joke with you and you were faking dumb. dumb. I would yeah. never ever do it again. Like yeah. the, the, the gag would be over. Yeah. But I think there's one conflict that I'm trying to process is if we, if we like what you guys are talking about with the book that you... Um, Peter Zihan. Yeah, so I mean, how do you see... How do you see us keeping our dollar strong globally with all of the dynamics that go into strengthening it from a global perspective if we, if, if we continue to, out of maybe necessity, turn internally and say... Let me turn to page 93. <laughs> <laughs> it's in here. Um, the, uh, the way, it, the, it, it, to, by definition, to have a, the world's most prolific product the best product ever invented by mankind, better than hotcakes, you have to have insatiable demand. And there's a few ways you can get insatiable demand. One, you can tax your citizens in US dollars. They have to get more dollars to pay you. Two, you can flood the world with low interest loans. For 30 years, they have to pay you back in US dollars. Three, you can insist that all world uh, global transactions for oil have to be in US dollars, right? Uh, fourth, you can have a navy that enforces that, right? And I can't remember my fifth one. I have another one in there. But I'll go back to one thing on the loan. So the euro dollar, not the euro, the euro dollar, okay? The euro dollar is lent into existence, and dollars here are lent into existence now. It's not used to be that way, okay? But when you go to a bank, okay, and they have $100 in their accounts, and all of us go to the bank and, and want a $100 loan, they just write it and we lend you $100. That's how, that's, they don't actually print the money. The bank print, prints, brings, brings dollars into existence by doing loans. 
and I do the loan because I'm FDIC, I'm a bank FDIC insured, the FDIC has allowed me to do this because they want their dollar lent because they know it's got, okay, so. Fractional reserve bank. Yeah, fractional reserve. So, so if you think about what happened, and, and I know for some of these guys it's review, but not, not you, Kellen, this is not review for you, and I, maybe a couple in the back. Uh, the, it's, it's the, um, it's December 2018. And the Federal Reserve says, we're going to raise interest rates three times in 2019. Why? The economy is doing great. Unemployment is low. In January 2019, less than 45 days later, they said, we're sorry. We're not going to raise interest rates three times. We're going to lower interest rates three times. What just happened? Something huge just happened. It, it, it's huge. They were going to raise three. 30 days later, they're going to lower three times. That year... March, I read a report, there's $3 trillion in Europe being traded at negative interest rates. I don't know what a negative interest rate is. I have an economic degree. I don't even know what it is. That summer, it's $14 trillion. And what I figured out was the Federal Reserve decided, I believe, wait a minute, people are borrowing money in Europe at zero interest rates. Yeah, we can go. So we have to lower our interest rates as low as possible, not to zero, almost possible, so that we can compete against all these loans. So we can proliferate our number one product. They did that on purpose so that if you're going to borrow, don't borrow German, don't borrow Spain, borrow the U.S. dollar, just it's barely above 0%, and it's the world reserve currency, so borrow our stuff for 30 years, and then you have to pay us back in 30 years, which makes the dollar proliferate, right? And that creates insatiable demand. And that's what I th thought they did. That's my theory. And anyway. that's why they lowered it on purpose. They bought bonds. Now, now you can just lower interest rates, but it doesn't take everything down. You have to take the bond market down. The Federal Reserve on their balance sheet bought $120 billion of bonds each month for 30 plus months. If you buy bonds, buy bonds, buy bonds, buy bonds, the yield goes down, down, down. Buy bonds, buy bonds, buy bonds, the yield goes down, down, down. I take the bonds and I put them on the Fed's balance sheet. Why? Why are they buying the bonds? To keep interest rates low so that you're borrowing American dollars. So again, if you have the number one product of all time, you have to be pretty smart to be able to proliferate and keep that thing as number one. It's not by accident. That's back to the idiot waiter. So... And then I was going to ask you, so you always list the Navy. Why not the military at large? Well, it's because <laughs> it, it is the military, but the, the, because in 1944, it kind of happened like this. The Bretton Woods Agreement that they, the, the war was almost over. We knew we were going to win the war. We're making 50,000 planes a year. A thousand planes a week are coming off our assembly lines. Germany's making 4,000 planes a year. We're making 50,000 planes a year. It, it was math. So a little place in New Hampshire called Bretton Woods, 44 countries sent 1,000 people to reset the world currency. And they basically said, listen, because of World War II, U.S. came in late, and they were selling all their crap to all the warring countries. And World War I, we came in late, and we had a gold confiscation in 1933. The United States has, now get this, this is a crazy statistic, the United States has 60% of all the gold bullion in the world we have in our Fort Knox and places. So the U.S. dollar right now is going to be backed by gold. And the French franc is not going to be backed by gold anymore. The French franc will be backed by the U.S. dollar. Okay? And all we really ask, it didn't say this, but all we really ask is, if you buy and sell your oil in U.S. dollars, you don't, you don't need to have your own navy anymore. We'll be your navy. The French's navy was gone. Italy's navy was gone. China's navy was gone. Japan's navy was gone. Russia's navy was gone. Everyone's navy is gone. The U.S. had their navy intact, and Britain had some. And the navy is very, very expensive for a country. It's one of the most expensive things a country can do, is have a navy. And so we just said, you know what? Buy and sell in U.S. dollars, in oil, and we'll be your navy. So a little country around the world wants to sell its goods, its trinkets, its chairs, its furniture to the United States. They don't need to have a navy anymore. If long as they buy and sell in U.S. dollars. And so that's why the Navy is the tip of the spear there. Because now, because it, it has created global trade and no country has more benefited by this system than China. 
China has had the fastest growing economy of any society in world history in the last 30 years. It's gone like this. No society in world history, even Romans, United States, has done as fast as they've done. They have benefited by having a world reserve currency, US dollar, keeping the world reserve currency relatively flat, and US Navy patrolling the seas. China has benefited because they need, they need product coming to their product. They, they import 70%, 80% of their oil. They import 80% or 70%, 60% of their food. Because the US Navy's out there you know, making sure pirates aren't all, all over the place. But now, that's not true anymore. You don't want to buy in US dollars anymore? Well, you know, what pirates, you've got to have your own Navy, you've got to spend, you've got to, you've got to make your own ships. That's, what, that's why I always put the US Navy up there. Can I add something to that? Yeah, go. The US Navy. We have 11 super carriers, super aircraft carriers. Yep. Combined world, if you combine, they have aircraft carriers, but they're like World War II class aircraft carriers, would have a combined about three. One aircraft carrier, so we just parked the Ford, the brand new Ford class carrier off of Israel, is the third largest air force in the world. Mm. One aircraft carrier. So if that parks off your ocean, that's the, and the US is the number one air, so it's US, they it's China, and then the aircraft carrier would be the third most powerful air force. And one aircraft carrier? One, we have 11 of them. And they're powered by two nuclear um, engines. They can, they can leave port for 50 years. They don't have to have a port. They don't need gas. They're powered by nuclear engines. It's their city. I mean, there's, it's insane. Like one, and we, don't, we underestimate the power of aircraft carriers. It's massive. Yeah. So in Taiwan, China was taking over Taiwan two years ago. The U.S. parked an aircraft carrier right there, which cools everything down. But it didn't this time. This is the third, third or fourth Taiwan conflict. They parked a second one in the area. And they actually parked, I, I read a report, I was trying to verify, they, I heard one report, they parked a third one in the North Sea. And then everything cooled down. China was like, oh, shit, these guys are serious. They parked three aircraft carriers in the South China Sea, right between Taiwan and then at the North. And, I mean, imagine having three of the world's largest air force right off your shore. So anyways, okay. yeah, that's why you put the US Navy on. They remind me of something I gotta tell you. I just learned this a few weeks ago, and I, and I am still, I'm just too flabbergasted by it. In 1989, Gorbachev and Reagan took down the wall in Germany. West Germany, East Germany, you remember this? Yep. Okay. I started selling used jeans at that point for nine years. I sold used jeans to the Eastern Bloc countries. I made a lot of money. My two partners moved to Southern Germany. I grabbed used jeans all over the United States and mostly Western United States and shipped to them. I had seamstresses all day long, dyeing, scrubbing, Sewing, shipping, dyeing, sewing, scrubbing, shipping, and they, my partners sold to Prague. They went to Prague, they went to Austria, they sold jeans all over the place. Okay. Now, this is crazy. PepsiCo was the first company that I know of went into Moscow to start selling Pepsi. Okay, now watch this. So, PepsiCo, C Co, okay, owns Pizza Hut, okay? Okay. And Pizza Hut goes in after PepsiCo and starts opening Pizza Huts, which is really hard to do. It took them a lot of money, everything. Okay. So then Pizza Hut starts selling pizza, selling pizza. They're doing great, right? But they're getting paid in rubles, and they're buying a lot of their products from other countries in U.S. dollars. At that point, you could not exchange the ruble for anything outside, outside of Russia. G get this? Okay. This is funny. This is hilarious. So Pizza Hut goes, what are we going to do with all these rubles? They call their parent company, PepsiCo, who's been in Russia longer. Hey, guys, what are you guys doing with all your rubles? PepsiCo, oh, we, we, had, we, got that, we solved that. We worked out with the, the Russian government that we, when we have a bunch of rubles, right? I don't even know how to spell rubles. Rubles. When we have a bunch of rubles, okay, PepsiCo has the option to use their rubles and go and buy ships, and submarines from the Russian government because they're not using it anymore. So PepsiCo starts buying ships and subs. What do we do? We launder it. That's what we do. Then, then <laughs> they were selling them to other countries like Ukraine what? for U.S. dollars. <laughs> they did this for years. If that doesn't show you how powerful this is the U.S. dollar is, when you have to do this gymnastics to get U.S. dollars, at one point they, they, they said if PepsiCo would have, you know, all the stuff they bought, 
if they would have kept all those submarines, they would have been the ninth largest navy in the world with all the stuff they had to do to get their money out of <laughs> Moscow. Anyway, that's pretty funny. That's, that's hilarious, man. Yeah, it's long, right? Subs! They're buying subs! Not, not, not subway subs. <laughs> not subway subs. They're buying actual subs and selling them to Ukraine. <laughs> they make soft drinks. <laughs> yes! I'm selling sugar water so I can buy subs. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Anyway. It's pretty awesome. Okay. I got way more stuff, but we'll have to do another night. So I think that I think I've talked about it.